So I'm going to talk to you about music to shape brain networks for auditory skills. And I will focus on speech and noise because that's an everyday task and I'm interested in how reshaping our nervous system affects our ability to do everyday tasks. Um, and from a medicine intersection, this is music and medicine, um, the idea that the way our nervous system is shaped is going to affect our classroom learning, our reading development, remediation, and what happens to our nervous system as we age. Uh, so music training changes sound processing in the brain uh, for sound-based skills. And so from a medical standpoint, again, uh, dyslexia, autism, aging, uh, these are important themes. Uh, today, I'm going to focus, as I said, just on the topic of hearing and noise. Um, so music is this model for plasticity in the auditory system. And uh, it's not a new idea. The idea of experience-dependent plasticity is a very old one. And so we're standing on great big solid shoulders um, of a lot of research that shows us that our nervous system, and specifically our auditory system, is very malleable and changes with experience. And so our work on the neuroplasticity in musicians is really just a novel population on which to study a well-worn phenomenon. So here's my little roadmap. I'm going to talk first about music being a powerful biological influence, a little bit about our approach, uh, tell you just some snapshots of music for a smarter ear in terms of perceptual and cognitive benefits, uh, and then I will focus on hearing and noise and, and with some theoretical considerations. So uh, music is biologically powerful. And as Ani Patel said before, um, music has lasting effects on brain functions within our lifetimes. And you, know, you can think of evolution as occurring over millennia, but in fact, you know, we have in our bodies here a biological experiment where we can look at uh, the evolution of uh, how it changes over time. And so Ani Patel, if I can quote him again, he calls music a transformative technology of the mind. Um, and Clearly, it transforms sound processing in the brain, and that's my focus. Um, so our approach then, of course, as I'm talking to you now, the nerves in your brains are giving off electricity. We can capture that electricity with scalp electrodes, and we can pull out auditory pathway activity. And what is very unique, I think, and, and very helpful from a biological standpoint about our approach is that um, the brain waves that we record actually physically resemble the sound waves. So here is the sound wave, and here is the brain wave. And you can see they physically look like each other. And if I could have the sound now, um, this is the speech sound. Da, would you play it, please? Just, you got to hit the icon. Da. Yeah, and then hit the guy next to it. OK, so that's the brain's response. And let's just go through these. Go to the next two, the next pair. Da. Go. Da. Keep going. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I got to click you. That's the brain response, the sound wave, the brain wave. Now let's uh, hear a little bit of this. Please just uh, hit the picture. OK, so, so play that again, because it's cool. Oh, that's all right. Um, OK, so uh, the other important thing about um, music and its representation in the nervous system is that the, the, the nervous system is not static. It is experience dependent. And so not only do we have pathways that connect our ear to our brain, but more importantly, even, are the pathways, the even more massive pathways that move down, that connect our nervous system um, to every part of itself. And so, um, as, as, as uh, has been said before, what we do with our nervous system, how we spend our time, clearly affects our perceptions. Um, so what do we know about music for a smarter ear? Just a few snapshots. Um, this is a work that uh, Gabriela Musacchia did a number of years ago, who found that um, 
that musical experience not only changes the, how the nervous system responds to speech, uh, not only affects how the nervous system responds to music, but also how the nervous system responds to speech. Um, and so you can see here, um, the musician responses are in red, and the non-musicians in black, and you can just see that the musician responses to speech sounds are um, more vigorous than um, in the musicians and in the non-musicians. Uh, we also see that if you change your pitch as you do uh, linguistically, as you ask a question or a statement, um, we can see that uh, here you can have a pitch that goes up and then comes down and then goes up again. Um, musicians are just way better neurally, we know this, at tracking the pitch of a changing sound. And this is a complex sound. And I'd like to show you um, a kid on the autism spectrum of disorders. Um, this is a very simple pitch trajectory, just going from a higher pitch to a lower pitch, the way that uh, our voice changes when we're finishing a sentence, or it would go up if we're asking a question, and a typically developing nervous system follows those pitch changes very well. Um, a child on the autism spectrum, some of the children do not follow that pitch tracking, and so it makes it difficult for a child on the spectrum to understand how I mean it. Um, musical experience generalizes to vocal emotion. If you can hit that, uh, that baby icon, please, um, you'll hear what you can see here. Yeah, so here's the sound wave and here are the brain waves. And what I can show you is that the musician's response, especially to this very complex portion of the stimulus, is very much enhanced compared to the non-musicians. And what is important to notice is that this very simple portion here of the stimulus is actually less represented by the nervous system. It's as though the musician is going to be spending less neural resources for the easy acoustically easy material and saving its neural resources for the difficult stuff. And the point is that with musical experience, it's not just a volume knob effect. Uh, you have enhancement of elements of sounds that are meaningful. So um, a selective enhancement. Cognitive skills, memory, and attention. And um, there have been effects of musical experience in these domains. And now let me really hone in on hearing, speech, and noise. So hearing, speech, and noise is hard for everyone, um, but it certainly impacts learning in a noisy classroom. It's particularly hard as we get older, um, and it is difficult for children with a variety of language disorders. Uh, so we asked here, can music experience help? And our thinking is that musicians are particularly good at extracting complex um, sounds from a complex soundscape. Uh, you're always listening for a harmony or a melody line. Here the three bops are each lis listening to the sound of their own instrument. And so we wondered whether this skill, this ability to pull out a relevant signal from a complex tapestry might then generalize to hearing your friend's voice in a noisy restaurant, which again is pulling out the relevant signal from a complex background? Um, and the answer is just resoundingly yes. And so what we see is on standardized measures of hearing, speech, and noise, so we have musicians repeat back sentences, and the sentences are presented in increasingly noisy backgrounds. We find that musicians are just way better than non-musicians at hearing, speech, and noise. And importantly, this gets better with experience. So the more years, a person has played music, the greater the effect. We see this in children. So these are children now, um, school-age children. Again, children with musical training are hearing speech and noise better. And this is the graph that I think every parent would like to show their child uh, to show them that the hours of weekly practice actually relates to how effective you will be at overhearing that conversation on the playground that you care about. <laughs> Um, so hearing a noise is, is a very common difficulty for older adults, and um, it, this does lead to medical problems such as uh, social isolation and depression. And what we have found is that musicians who, so, and, and by, when I talk about musicians, I'm talking about um, people who are ranging from being professional musicians to people who are just hack musicians like me, who on a good week are, are playing music maybe five or six hours a week. 
um, but you know, have played music regularly throughout their lives. Um, and these older musicians are just better at hearing speech and noise. Um, and so the idea is that musical training can offset age-related declines in speech and noise perception. Um, we also can see that older musicians um, can offset some of the age-relating timing delays. So as we age, our neuronal activity, we know, just becomes slower. And so you can see here um, a younger adult compared to an older adult, timing, neuronal timing is slower. And uh, the older musicians here are showing neural timing that is um, commensurate with a younger non-musician. Um, and so please see our poster about this. Um, so if we look now at the neural response, because we can, we can look at the, the elements, the pitch, timing, and timbre that are important for our um, representation of both speech and music. There's this tremendous overlap. If you look at musician and non-musician responses to a speech sound, this is a speech sound da in quiet, you can see that the responses are pretty similar in quiet, but look in noise. I mean, you don't even need to do the fancy analyses that we do in the lab in order to see that the non-musician's responses are just much more affected by the background noise. So um, one way of looking at this, remember I told you that uh, the response, the brain response, is actually physically resembling the stimulus, so that a stimulus to response correlation is a meaningful metric. And what we can see is that musicians um, have a much better um, stimulus to response correlation in noise compared to the non-musicians, where you can see that the fidelity with which their nervous system is representing sound and noise is really reduced. And importantly, this measure of fidelity, the stimulus to response correlation, correlates with something we care about, people's ability to hear in noise. And we see this pattern in children as well. So these are analogous data in school-aged children. Again, see that the children who don't have musical training, their stimulus to response correlations go way down in noise. Um, and consonants are particularly vulnerable to noise. Um, and we are able, by looking at timing differences, to see that people who have good uh, speech and noise perception are able to represent, this, these are the formant transitions, which are the elements of sound, which distinguish a ba from a da from a ga. And uh, so we know that there is this very nice relationship in anybody. People who are good at hearing speech and noise also have good neural responses. And we can see that in musicians, this very natural ability of the nervous system uh, to respond to these differences is enhanced. And so here you can see that this is where the consonants are differed and the uh, vowels that are the same. Uh, you can see no phase, no timing uh, shift. I think uh, I'm going to skip this, um, but I want to make the point, remember and this comes to this whole idea of top-down efferent modulation, is that hearing a noise advantage is mediated by cognitive function, and in this case, memory. So across the lifespan as we've looked at it, um, young adults, children, and older adults, we know, I showed you the data already, they're better at hearing speech and noise if they have musical training. In everybody, um, they are also better at working memory. And importantly, the working memory ability correlates with the hearing and noise ability. So there really seems to be a relationship between, A of all, the enhanced working memory in somebody with musical experience, which of course you can imagine. I mean, as a musician, if you're trying to copy what it is that you've just heard, um, you are, are, are going to enhance those skills and it's going to help you keep track of what I've just said a few milliseconds ago in order to understand what I'm saying now. Same skill. Um, again, see our poster here for more details. Um, so so we're, you know, by, by doing structural equation modeling, uh, we have been trying to really understand the different factors, uh, how hearing relates to speech and noise, uh, the way in which memory intersects with this and how our neural encoding metrics can, expe can explain um, various portions of the variance. And so we're looking to see what are the interrelationships and what is the directionality as well. 
Um, and of course, our, our fundamental question here is what does musicianship bring to this model? So I hope that I've, I've convinced you that musicians have perceptual and neural advantages for processing speech and noise. And I just want to end with some theoretical considerations of why might this be? Um, well, musicians are constantly mapping sound to meaning. So again, what we do with what we hear changes the way our nervous system responds to sound. And um, just a couple of examples. There are harmonic relations. There are major, minor, thirds, diminished, augmented. Um, relations. There are dynamics that signal mood. So crescendo, diminuendo, uh, just the, the, how, how fast the notes are to be played. The fact that there is a relationship between a note on a page and a sound. Um, the circle of fifths. Uh, there are historic sounds the, the, that, that we've, we've made these, these, uh, these associations. And if I can make this analogy here, um, so here you've got a daddy and he's listening to his baby cry, and um, he's learning his baby's specific cry because it's important to daddy to hear his baby crying. And importantly here, neural connections are being formed. And how many of you have seen the, the March of the Penguins? Right, I mean, it was amazing how those mommy penguins were able to recognize the sound of their baby penguins when they came back from feeding, right? So neural connections must have been formed there. Um, and after a while, dad can confidently pick out his baby's cry amidst other babies crying. And of course, <laughs> you can do what you will with the information that your brain feeds you. Um, but, but we know from a series of studies that um, how our brain uh, works will actually influence how the cochlea, so this is the end organ, the hair cells of our cochlea respond to sound. And what is very interesting is that these studies here have shown that this efferent, synonymous with top-down cortical fugal system, is modulating how that business end, the hair cells of our cochlea, actually work and more in musicians, okay? Um, so the model that we, the framework that we really are, are, are putting all of our work in is this idea, uh, and, and we've reviewed in this particular article, um, data from many, many labs um, all over the world using different approaches, um, but basically that are telling us the same story, that what it is that we do with sound as musicians, these sound to meaning transformations, are then fed back because we have this rich corticofugal efferent system that uh, tunes our auditory system and changes our auditory system in fundamental ways so that it becomes more effective for things that we care about, such as learning to read, understanding what people mean, being able to hear speech and noise. And you have a, a system that is, is dynamic, it's able to change, but it's also stable. And it's very good at recognizing patterns, pattern detection in sound. This is something that we know in clinical populations is disrupted, especially, for example, in poor readers. Musicians inherently, when they are asleep, their nervous system will process acoustic patterns in a more organized manner. Um, we have a couple of ongoing studies now where we're looking um, at uh, youngsters um, and looking at uh, their biological and learning outcomes. Uh, we also have a longitudinal study where we're looking at uh, high school kids in Chicago area uh, charter schools. These are schools exclusively serving low SES kids who have now music in their curriculum. And this is important because most of the data that we have on uh, music and its experience in the nervous system um, has been gathered on people who have been privileged enough to afford private instruction. And so we're going to follow these kids longitudinally and measure their biological outcomes and learning outcomes. And, and I don't know what we will find, but I am expecting that we will be able to provide some ironclad biological evidence for how musical experience may enrich nervous system development. Um, so music then provides a stable foundation for other auditory functions and facilitates these sound to meaning um, relationships for non-musical tasks. Um, and the biological basis is just that we have an adaptive sensory system uh, 
I started out saying music is biologically powerful and it changes the nervous system throughout our lifetimes. Um, and so I, I believe that the medical implications are huge. Um, and we can think about some medical implications in terms of uh, the development and remediation of language disorders, dyslexia, offset age-related communication deficits. These are just, just a few. Um, and these are the wonderful people who are currently doing all of the work that I've talked to you about. Uh, our music work is funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and I would like to present to you uh, Alexandra Parby Clark, Emily Hitner, uh, Samantha O'Connell, Jessica Slater, uh, who are here and have posters. Dana Strait is in South Africa uh, at the moment, but has contributed to this work, scientists and musicians at the same time. Um, I encourage you, please, oh please, come and visit our, our website um, because we really try. I mean, we are trying to bridge this gap. We are trying to make our little discoveries in the lab accessible to parents and teachers educators, scientists across a number of fields. I encourage you to go to the slideshow um, on, under each one of these topics, and it starts very broadly. You can download the nitty gritty articles under publications. I've got little cards. If anybody wants a little card with our, our website, I'm happy to give it to you. And thank you so much for listening.